It's been a hot summer and I'm sure you know the oceans have been hot too. There's been a, been a lot of headlines recently in the news about marine heat waves. And that's because we're seeing a lot of ocean warming out there right now. There's heat waves in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic um, off of Australia. And it's projected that around 50% of the ocean surface will be in a heat wave state this fall. But what you haven't read about yet is that these marine heat waves will cause species to move around. This is a global map of ocean temperature with colder temperatures in purple and warmer temperatures in red. And our conventional understanding is that when a heat wave occurs, species will shift towards their nearest pole. So when a heat wave occurs in the Northern hemisphere, species will shift towards the North pole. And when it occurs in the Southern hemisphere, species will shift towards the South pole. And we have a lot of empirical data that supports this. For example, we saw juvenile white sharks shift towards the North, North Pole along the coast of California during a heat wave. We saw yellow whiting shift towards the South Pole off of Australia during another heat wave. King penguins did the same thing. Their foraging range shifted towards the South Pole during a heat wave in the Indian Ocean. And a group of commercial species shifted north along the East Coast, US, uh, along the East Coast of the US shelf during a another heat wave. But most of these inferences come from studies examining the effect of one heat wave on one species or examining the effect of one heat wave on multiple species. So in this study, we asked, what about the effect of multiple heat waves on multiple species? Will we still see the same relatively uniform north or poleward shift or does the story become more complicated? The Northeast Pacific is an ideal test bed to ask a question like this. First, because it has a lot of heat waves. These are four recent heat wave events in our area. We've got 2014, 2015, 2019, and 2020. And these maps are showing temperature anomalies. So blue colors indicate waters that are colder than average, and red colors indicate waters that are warmer than average. So our heat waves are these red sort of blob shapes outlined in black. If you're familiar with the Northeast Pacific, you'll know that 2014 and 2015 are part of the same event. We normally refer to that as the blob. But we separated them out into two different events in this study because during 2015, this pre-existing heat wave combined with an El Nino. So it had a lot of very different physical signature. The Northeast Pacific is also a great place for this question because, because we have a lot of animal data. There was a large scale um, animal tracking study in the Northeast Pacific called the Tagging of Pacific Predators Project. And it, it collected a lot of data on these 14 species. So we've got tunas, yellowfin, bluefin, and albacore. We have sharks, blue shark, mako shark, white shark, and salmon shark. Marine mammals, elephant seal, California sea lion, and blue whales, seabirds, sooty shearwater, black footed albatross, and lazy and albatross, and leatherback turtles. So, in this study, we asked what are the effects of these four marine heat waves on these 14 marine predators? And we did this using species distribution models. Now, if you're not in the modeling world, you don't have to understand how these models work to understand the rest of this talk. The one thing to take away is that these results are inferences from models as opposed to direct observations. If you are a species distribution modeler, here's a little bit more about what's under the hood. We started by acquiring predator tracking data from TOP, that's the Tagging of Pacific Predators Project. So this animation is showing about 100 blue whales moving across a decade. The different colors in this animation are tracking data from the different years. And then next we acquired environmental data from satellites and ocean models. So we have surface variables like temperature and chlorophyll A, and we have subsurface variables like oxygen at 200 meters and mixed layer depth. So surface heat waves can extend down into the water column. And so we wanted to account for some of the changes at depth because we have some deep diving species, for example, elephant seals. So this tracking data tells us where animals were in space and time. And this environmental data tells us the environmental conditions at those spaces and times. And then we can link all of this data using species distribution models. In this case, we're using boosted regression trees, which is a type of machine learning that's really flexible to different types of data and different types of assumptions. 
And we build a bunch of models for each individual species and then cross compare them to find the model that performs the best. So we might cross validate by space to look at um, spatial biases or time to look at temporal biases. And a really important step is to test models against novel validation data. This is data that the model has never seen before. Um, it might be collected using different methods than the data used to build the model. It might be collected in different locations and times than the data used to build the model. And so it's a really good stress test of how, your, how well your model can perform on novel data that it's never seen before. Once we have a model that we're confident is robust, we can take this model, which tells us the statistical relationship between the species and the environment. So it might say, blue whales like temperatures between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. And we can predict that model on environmental data from different time slices of interest. So let's say we're interested in where blue whales were during October 1st, 2012. And we can produce a map of predicted distribution. So this is showing blue whale predicted distributions for October 1st, 2012. In this map, blue waters have low habitat suitability for blue whales and yellow colors have, uh, yellow waters have high habitat suitability for blue whales. And that red color there is um, the observed tracking data for blue whales during October. So you can see we have high agreement from where we observed blue whales in red and where we predicted blue whales in yellow. And that's good, that's what we'd like to see. Of course, in this study, we're interested in these heat wave events. So these, this is a time series of sea surface temperature anomalies from 2000 to 2020. And those red bars are the anomaly peaks when the anomalies were most extreme during each of our heat wave years, 2015, or 2014, 2015, 2019, and 2020. And those anomaly peaks occurred in the fall of each year during August through October. So with our models, we really want to ask, how does the predicted distribution of, for example, blue whales vary during these four um, periods of extreme temperatures compared to their average distribution, the average baseline um, of where blue whales are. So we take our models and we predict baseline condi conditions, and that's the average prediction 2000 to 2020 from August to October. And then we predict during the heat wave event, so August through October of 2014, for example. And then we just subtract these two. We find the distribution anomalies. So this is the baseline prediction, 2000 to 2020, minus the marine heat wave prediction, August through October of 2014. And in this plot here, red colors are waters that were more suitable for blue whales during the heat wave compared to average conditions. And blue waters are um, areas that were less suitable for blue whales during the heat waves compared to average conditions. So we can see waters off of Washington, Washington and Oregon became more suitable during this 2014 event. And this is sort of the building block of our analysis. We can take this information and probe it to answer different questions. This whole workflow would re be repeated individually for each of the 14 species. And um, this last step, step five, is repeated for each of the four heat waves. So we found that marine heat wave impacts on species are surprisingly diverse. This is a map of central California. We've got the San Francisco Bay, the Monterey Bay, and the Channel Islands. And this black dot represents the average location of albacore tuna habitat from August to October. 2000 to 2020. So if we were to take all of our predictions across that 20 year time series and summarize them using a single point, it would be here somewhere off of Monterey Bay. And then we can look at how the heat waves caused habitat to displace or shift beyond this normal average location. So for example, during the 2014 heat wave, albacore tuna habitat shifted to the Northwest by about 300 kilometers. And then during 2015, we see a similar shift to the Northwest. It's a little further, it's around 350 kilometers. And so, so far this supports the general understanding that species shift towards the nearest pole during heat waves. But in 2019, we see something very different. We actually see a Southeastward displacement and the same thing in 2020, but to a lesser extent. So already the story is more complicated just looking at one species species, and it gets a lot more complicated when we look at 14 species. In this plot, we have our 14 species on the y-axis, 
we have each of our four heat wave events on the X, 2014, 2015, 2019, 2020. Panel A shows displacement distance, so how far animals shift during heat waves. And panel B shows displacement direction, what direction those shifts occur in. And this is actually the same information you were looking at, at the pre on the previous slide. So we have shifts of several hundred kilometers to the northwest for albacore tuna in 2014 and 15, and then much more moderate shifts to the southeast in 19 and 20. So this is an example of variable impacts across heat waves. If we track one species across multiple heat wave events, we're not going to see a consistent impact. And this occurs in a lot of the species. So we can look at sooty shear water, which displaced moderately to the north during 14 and 15, and then pretty extremely to the northwest during 19 and 20. That 2020 displacement in sooty shear waters was, was the largest displacement we saw in any of the species. It was around 700 kilometers, and that's because some habitat near the Aleutian Islands became more suitable. If we look at leatherbacks, we see that they displaced in a different direction during each heat wave event. So they've got variable impacts across heat waves. And then there's another axis of variability here. This is variable impacts across species. So instead of looking at the rows, we're going to look at the columns. If we look at multiple species in one heat wave event, we don't see a consistent pattern. For example, in the 2015 event, species like black-footed albatross and lazy and albatross barely displaced at all. Those are those dark blue colors towards the top of the plot. And then species like blue shark and blue fin tuna displace several hundred kilometers. That's those yellow colors towards the center of the plot. If we look at displacement direction, we can see in 2019 species displaced in all four cardinal directions. So two axes of variability across heat wave and across species. And then for reference, I won't talk about these too much, but we looked at two other metrics of impact. Panel C is percent change range, so whether species ranges expanded or contracted during the heat wave events. And D is percent change area, whether species gained or lost habitat during the heat wave events. And these two metrics also show variability across species and across heat waves. I gave a version of this talk at our local museum a couple weeks ago, and a woman from the audience came up and said she really liked this slide because she could just squint at it and see that there was no consistent impact. So if you're interested in more details, I'd point you to the paper, but for now, just squint. Why do we see such a surprising diversity of impacts? I think there's three reasons. The first is physical. Heat waves have different drivers, evolution, and characteristics. Each heat wave is physically distinct. So if we compare the 2014 and the 2015 events, we can see that the locations of those warm water anomalies are different, and that in 2015, they're much hotter. And that's just talking about temperature. There's also differences in other variables like um, productivity, chlorophyll, oxygen, et cetera. So when we only examine one heat wave, we're only capturing one possible physical configuration. The second reason is ecological. Species have different environmental preferences. Each species occupies a unique environmental niche. This plot at the bottom shows the um, hypothetical temperature preferences of two species, species A that likes cold waters and species B that likes warm waters. And so when we have a heat wave event, we might expect species A to be more impacted, right? They like colder waters. When the, warmer, when the waters get warmer, they're gonna have a more extreme reaction than species B who likes the water to be warm. So when we only look at one species, we're only capturing one possible species environmental relationship. And then the last reason is scientific. Large negative impacts grab attention, small positive impacts less so. There's a bias in the literature towards studying um, extreme heat waves with severe impacts. If you work in the Northeast Pacific, you'll know that the blob has a lot of research devoted to it. And that's really good, that's important. That was a bad heat wave and we really wanna understand what happened so that we can make sure that we do better when it happens again. But it does mean that more moderate heat waves with more moderate impacts are less well represented in the literature. Now, the surprising diversity of impacts matters from a management perspective. 
we found that the heat waves drove shifts across jurisdictional boundaries and that these shifts varied across species and across heat waves. For example, 23% uh, of yellowfin tuna habitat shifted from Mexican waters into US waters during the 2014 event. And then during the 2015 event, 31% of yellowfin tuna habitat did that same shift from Mexican waters to US waters. When species shift jurisdictional boundaries, it brings new risks, rewards, and responsibilities. Yellowfin tuna is com are commercially valuable. It's a target species. It's the species we want to catch. And so when a country receives an influx of yellowfin tuna, they might have to increase processing plant capacity. There might not be the infrastructure in place on shore to process all that biomass that is now locally available. And we actually saw this occur in the Gulf of Maine during the 2012 heat wave, where uh, lobster became a lot more locally available, a lot more being caught and landed. And there wasn't the infrastructure in place on shore to process all of that biomass. And so the supply chain started lagging behind and the price of lobster dropped, which caused um, a lot of revenue loss for the fishery. The country that is losing yellowfin tuna habitat may need to compensate fishermen for lost revenue, right? The species that they base their livelihood on is no longer available to catch, and they might need some financial support until the yellowfin return. Or fishermen might need to switch to targeting swordfish. They might need to switch their target species. Now in 2019, we saw a reversal of this shift with 10% of yellowfin tuna habitat shifting from US waters into Mexican waters. And this would again then redistribute the risks, rewards, and responsibilities. We can see these patterns, these shift patterns uh, reflected in the empirical data. This is recreational landings for California from 2010 to 2019. And those bar colors indicate the source waters of those landings. So orange bars, those fish were sourced in US waters. Uh, beige bars were the, indicate fish that were sourced in Mexican waters. And so during 14 and 15, when we had these large shifts of yellowfin tuna habitat into US waters, we can see a spike in the proportion of catch that's sourced from US waters. And then in 2019, when yellowfin tuna habitat shifted back to Mexican waters, we can see much less catch coming from US waters. In another example, bluefin tuna, we saw 11% of their habitat shift from Mexican waters into US waters in 2014. And the same thing happened in 2015. Bluefin tuna are overfished, they're a quota managed species. And so when bluefin tuna shift into another country's waters, they mean they need to enact fisheries closures to prevent overfishing. This actually happened in US waters uh, during 2017. Bluefin tuna became a lot more locally available and there was a delay in the reporting that meant the quota was actually exceeded by 50 metric tons before we realized that the quota had been exceeded. Again, we can see these shifts represented in the empirical data. This is recreational bluefin landings uh, in the US from 1980 to 2020. And the colors are the same, source waters. So US waters are in orange, Mexican waters are in beige. And during that 2014, 2015 event, we can see the proportion of fish sourced from US waters uh, is much higher than in preceding years. Leatherback turtles are a bycatch species, and so the risks, rewards, and responsibilities are different. In 2014, we saw five, or we predicted 5% of leatherback turtle habitat shifting from Mexico into the high seas or international waters. And then in 2019, 12% of leatherback turtle habitat shifted from the high seas into the US and Mexican waters. Leatherback turtles are protected, they're endangered. It's a species we don't wanna impact with our fishing operations. And so when they shift into a new area, gear modifications or fisheries closures might need to be enacted to reduce bycatch. We might wanna put uh, turtle exclusion devices on fishing gear or close waters to fishing where we know leatherbacks are prone to aggregate. And again, we can see these patterns in the empirical data. This is a bycatch of leatherbacks in Hawaii's shallow, shallow set longline. This fleet operates in the high seas, international waters. 
Um, and so when we had these shifts of leatherbacks into international waters in 2014, we can see a spike in leatherback bycatch. And then in 2019, when we had leatherbacks shifting into national waters away from the high seas, we had no bycatch events. Now, I want to be clear, I don't think it's a one-to-one -one relationship between habitat shifts and these patterns in the empirical data. There's a lot of reasons that the empirical data could show these patterns, including regulation changes or changes in the magnitude of fisheries effort, changes in the location of fisheries effort. But it is um, it does help us know that we're passing some sort of laugh test that our model predicted patterns are also observed in the empirical data. Now to make any sorts of these management changes, decision makers need access to information on where predators are in real time. They need to know where blue whales are today or where leatherbacks are today. And we've taken a stab at this with Top Predator Watch. This is a now cast tool that predicts the distribution, the distribution of all 14 of these species every day. And the link at the bottom of the screen is public. Um, and I'll just show you what's on there. This is the Top Predator Watch landing page. It has a flyer summarizing information across all 14 of these species. The data goes back to fall of last year. So there's about a 12 month time series of data here. Um, you can scroll back and see previous flyers. We also serve this data in a spatial format. So for every species and every day, there's a roster grid of the predictions. And then there's an individual uh, mapped PNG if you don't want to process the roster data, you just want to see where the species were. And so one of the things I wanted to highlight in this talk is that this data is available, it exists, and we'd like you to use it. We, we you know, built it hoping it would be useful. And I'm very happy to follow up with anyone to talk about how you might use it and sort of explain more what the biases are, what it can and can't do, if you think this would be useful to your work. But it was our goal to be useful, so please don't hesitate to reach out. All right, but decision-making isn't really about reacting to what's going on in the water today. It's about planning ahead for what's going to happen in the future. So we need to move from real-time information to forward-looking information or forecasts. We're pretty good at forecasts for physical phenomena. For example, the weather forecast or hurricane track forecasts. This map here is actually a global marine heat wave forecast that was developed by Mike Jaycox et al. What we're less good at doing is forecasting ecological phenomena. So we're less good at saying where species are gonna to be tomorrow or next week or next season or next year. There are a number of applied examples of ecological forecasts that are used um, operationally, but as a whole, the field of ecological forecasting lags behind that of physical forecasting. So this is sort of where the science needs to go next. And the sooner we do it, the better. Here are the current conditions in the Northeast Pacific. We have a large heat wave developing um, offshore. It's hit the coast in a few places. And we're in an El Nino advisory. And the latest El Nino forecast suggests that this event will be as severe as anything we've seen on record by this spring. The last time we had a marine heat wave coincide with an El Nino event was that 2015 event I've been talking about in this talk. And that event was pretty severe. Um, we had a record number of humpback whale entanglements in crab fishing gear off California. Uh, there was cad collapse in Alaskan waters and the largest recorded mass seabird die off in history. And so we'd really like some advanced knowledge as to if 2023 is shaping up to look like 2015 or if it's gonna look completely different because if there's one thing I've learned through this paper, it's that marine heat waves are variable. As of now, we don't have advanced warning. We'll probably have to wait till after this event has unfolded to understand how it moves species around. But this is an area of research our group is actively working on. I'll just wrap up with a few um, take home points, some scientific needs that uh, became clear to me doing this study. And for each need, I'll point to some resources where you can get further information if you're interested and URLs for those resources. So the first is that we need ecosystem-based investigations of heat wave impact. That's multi-species and multi-heat wave. It's really hard to extrapolate impacts from one heat wave on one species to other heat waves or other species because these, these things have really different impacts. Again, if you work in the Northeast Pacific, 
there's a lot of opportunity to, opportunity to do this. These are six recent heat waves in our area. Uh, the x-axis is heat wave area, the y-axis is day of year. That black vertical line is sort of where we are now, September 2023. And that thick red line is our heat wave this year. So you can see it's following pretty similar patterns to the preceding five heat waves. The paper I've been talking about today covered the 2014, 2019, and 2020 events. And it'd be really great to have a better understanding of what happened in 2021, 2022, and 2023. For some resources, there's a number of places to get heat wave data. Our group uh, runs the blob tracker, which is focused on heat waves in the Northeast Pacific. The data for this plot on the screen comes from the blob tracker. Uh, if you're working elsewhere than the Northeast Pacific, there's the Marine Heat Wave Watch, which is run by the folks at Coral Reef Watch. It's a global plot product that's updated regularly and it's served with heat waves in um, severity classification bins. So it'll be moderate, severe, extreme, et cetera. Species data is often a bottleneck for multi-species studies. Um, a lot of it's private. Uh, here I've listed three locations where you can get data. You might have to work with the data holders to get permission, but the Animal Telemetry Network, the Seabird Tracking Database, and NOAA's trawl data. Second, we need to report on diverse and inconsistent heat wave impacts. This is pretty common for the physics. There's a number of papers that compare and contrast heat waves from a physical standpoint. We're comfortable saying heat waves are physically different. I think we're less comfortable telling a messy story in terms of ecology. We look for clean, consistent patterns. And I think it's, it's good to report inconsistent patterns that the heat waves really do have different impacts and so two papers that do this, um, the paper I've been talking about today, impacts of marine heat waves on top predator distributions are variable but predictable. And then a new paper by Alexa Fredston et al. Marine heat waves are not a dominant driver of change in demersal fishes. I'm sure there are others. This is, these are just two that came out in the last month. We need ecological nowcasts or better yet forecasts to inform climate ready management. We know that future heat waves will not necessarily follow the patterns of past heat waves. And so we need to be predicting impacts in real time as they occur, or better yet, ahead of time using forecasts. Top Predator Watch is an example of a nowcast. It predicts where species are today. And there's a forecast um, that's running for southern bluefin tuna off of Australia as well. Once we have ecological nowcasts or forecasts, we need to design climate ready management tools that ingest them to swiftly respond to diverse heat wave impacts. So top predator watch tells you where species are today, but it doesn't go a step further to tell managers what to do about that. There's no associated management recommendation. So some tools that do include management recommendations, um, tools that ingest nowcast are ecocast and total. Those were both designed to support fisheries off of California. Ecocast provides management recommendations on where and where not to fish based on the distributions of bycatch and target species. And the total tool um, serves as a management trigger to let folks know when to enact a fisheries closure in the Southern California Bight to avoid the bycatch of loggerhead turtles. And then uh, for tools that ingest forecasts, decision-making in Maine's lobster fishery is informed by a forecast on stock status. So I'll leave it here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak and for attending the talk today. I'm happy to take any questions and I look forward to some discussion on what sort of heat wave work you're all working on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Heather, that was great. Um, so I'm gonna lean on Mario a little bit to um, moderate the questions that are coming up in the Q&A. And um, so I guess the options are, you can either raise your hand and, or you can type your question in the Q&A feature of Zoom. Um, but I'm going to kick off with a really naive question, Heather, because that's what I do. Um, are the so the spatial distribution of the predators are they responding mostly to the changes in temperature, and they, are they chasing the right temperature water, or are they chasing their prey items, or is that a chicken and the egg question? <laughs> well, we don't have prey in the model. As close as we get to biology is a metric of productivity. Um, so what they're doing in actuality, I think that's a more complicated question. In terms of the models, they're responding to a number of environmental variables. Temperature wasn't necessarily the most important predictor. 
for example, blue whales were really driven by chlorophyll because they're often following their preferred prey krill as they move up and down the coast. Um, I will say we built a suite of models that just included temperature and they perform much more poorly than our multi uh, covariate models. So it, it's not just a temperature story. It really depends on each species, which variable is, is driving their shifts most strongly. Great, thanks. Thank you. We also have a, a question in the chat about what do shifts look like decades ahead and kind of comparing some of the long-term projections and the real-time predictions you all are doing. Mm. Yeah, so our projection work, so this is um, species responding to the long-term temperature warming signal out to, you know, around 2100, um, is led by others in the lab. But when we, when we look at the shifts in terms of kilometers, they're fairly uh, comparable. And that's because some of the temperature extremes that we see during these heat wave events are on par with those that we project to occur at 2100. And so that's one of the things that's useful to study about marine heat waves is they get us, they allow us to have little windows into what might happen at the end of the century, um, just because the temperatures can be so extreme during them. And I'm I'm seeing a question from Piper Olson. I'll just read it and to be a little more efficient. Um, uh, she asked, uh, on average, how long did habitat shifts last after each of the heat waves before species shifted back to their normal range? So what, what's the persistence in re the response? Yeah, that's a great question. And when we didn't get at this paper, I do know that um, data indicates that we never recovered from the blob that you know, combine, if if we look at it in its entirety, it began in 2013 and it really ended in 2016. And it looks like we never really saw a return to the pre-blob state after that heat wave occurred. Um, so these things can very, very fundamentally, you know, change our ecosystems. But we didn't capture that in, in our paper. We just looked at deviations from the long-term baseline as opposed to the persistence of those deviations. So does that suggest there's a it's kind of a ratcheting, just a shift? Like once there's a there's a, there's a shift in the habitat utilization, then they tend not to go back. And if yeah, so, why, that, I mean, that kind of surprises me, right? If they're if they're responding to the environment and they're moving in response to the environment, why don't they move back? <laughs> right. I mean, I think because there's other things that affect. You know, it's not just all about the environment. Like there's there's biomass uh, questions. You know, like maybe the species became a lot more prolific during a heat wave event and it never had those pressures to shrink back down to its pre-heat wave size. We certainly saw that with, I'm gonna get it wrong, sardine or anchovy during the blob event where they just became so much more um, locally available and they, they still haven't dropped back down. And so I don't know how well we really understand those mechanisms um, beyond that it's really, it's really complex and it's not all about the physics. There's, you know, there's also prey and predation. Maybe the predators did very badly during the heat wave and never bounced back and that's allowed the prey species to stay prolific. Mm. Um, so I don't have a good clear answer, but just that it's it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, sounds like you need a model. Yeah. <laughs> Lots, of model. Lots of models. Lots of models. Heather, I'm curious, you talked about kind of the hurricane analogy and that uh, history isn't necessarily predictive given the variability, but that those real-time predictions can still enable management actions. As you've been talking with the management community, what's the time scale of notice that they, they feel like they need with their current tools to make policy changes or make management changes? Are we talking that, you know, a day out they can make a change or months out? I think it's more on the, the scale of months. Um, one of my colleagues, Steph Brody, is working on forecasting a tool that's relevant to the entanglement question of whales and the in the crab fishery. And her forecasts are persist are skillful out 12 months. And and I think that's really a space that's useful. You know, with with policy and regulations, it takes it takes a lot of time to make a decision and then enact that decision. And so I, yeah, I think obviously the longer, the better. And we're really on the scale of months as opposed to days. Are there other questions for Heather or points of discussion? I'll throw one in while folks are, oh, well, oh, go for it. 
you should be able to unmute. Hey there. Okay. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. 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 Awesome. I was just curious if you have any follow up questions on like what you hope to find out in further studies or or anything that, that came up during this that you'd like to continue research on. Mm, that's a great question. You know, we, we talk a lot about um, predators as climate sentinels that we can watch what happens, you know, in high trophic level species to understand something about the ecosystem. Like when a, a heat wave occurs, we might see sea lions start to do poorly and we can understand that a big ecosystem shift has occurred. And I'm really curious if we can do that with, with humans through AIS, like Automatic Identification System Data or VMS vessel monitoring systems data, which, cause we're kind of a top predator. And I'm wondering if we can um, sort of monitor the behaviors of fishing fleets to understand when there's been a fundamental shift in the ecosystem state. I'm, you know, kind of noodling around how to do that. There's certainly plenty of data available and it's just, it's just thinking about, you know how that analysis would go and, and if it even makes sense. Like I sort of mentioned in the talk, there's so many things that can change the behavior of the fleet, you know, like regulations or um, changes in quotas, for example, and it's not all just environment. So it'd be a really complicated question to tease out if you can isolate that environmental signal from all the other uh, more anthropocentric factors that affect fishing behavior. So yeah, I mean, that's that's where I wanna go next. We'll see if it actually happens. It's all of course funding dependent. <laughs> awesome, Thanks. thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Will. Heather, you also talked about just the compilation of data set. And I think at reading through the paper, I was struck by just how much data you all pulled together to make this happen. I guess any reflections you have there in terms of tips for others who might want to pull together similar data sets up in the Salish Sea, or for those who are collecting the data, um, ways to make it easier to ingest? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think getting your data on one of these sort of aggregative repositories is, is so helpful. And then I also understand from the perspective of someone collecting data, like that takes a lot of work and a lot of money. And um, I understand the reason for, for keeping it more private, but just having access or even knowing that data is out there and being able to talk to the data holders and get them on board, that that was really huge. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a really, really tough question. Um, and that's one of the reasons like we moved to the modeling world. We actually didn't have data from the Tagging a Pacific Predators project that extended over these four heat wave events. That project really wrapped in 2010. So using models was a way of sort of rescuing older data sets and applying them to more modern time periods. So I think models, can really help in that sense. But um, of course, there's plenty of drawbacks of using models. So I don't know. I don't know if I have a, yeah, a clear answer. Hopefully that helps a little bit kind of move to models. And then um, if you can put your data on some of these repositories to allow other folks to use it. I will say this NOAA trial data, I just started looking into it and it's really, really good. It's what, um, for example, Alexa Fredston used in her paper. It's a, a long-term time series of a lot of species. And um, the link there is actually a GitHub link. So that data is just ready to download as is. Um, so I really recommend folks look into that as well. Chris, Chris right. I see your hand, go for it. Or it may be someone else PSI, but with Chris's name. I, I see multiple Chris's, so. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mariel. I think that's a mistake on our part when we came in on this link. Apologies. Um, I have a, I'm Stefano Mazzilli, not Chris <laughs> from PSI. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was just going to ask a question about um, the future research from you and your peers um, in other research groups around these data sets, because it's fantastic to see it being used in this way. Um, it's really about how confident you are in the interannual variability and ways to kind of improve our understanding of that long-term change in the decadal scale. Um, and then, you know, what, what steps are folks doing and, and what kind of gaps are there before we can really be confident, you know, whether this is like a, a baseline that you can compare to or it's a shifting baseline. 
Mm. Yeah. Well, certainly to, to assess how well our models could capture interannual variability, um, we did sort of a, a cross validation at daily time steps or monthly time steps. You know, can we can we predict on months the data has never seen before? Um, and the models did pretty good at that. Whether or not they'd be suitable to actually making management decisions, you know, if we'd be happy trusting them like we trust a weather forecast, um, that that I'm not sure. You know, it's it's you can build models that perform well through all your management checks, but if you'd be really comfortable, you know, basing on the water decisions on them. I, yeah, I don't know. That's always where I, where I get hung up. I'm happy to, to, you know, I think they're scientifically sound, but it's a, it's another question whether we want to base um, decisions that affect human lives off them. Uh, in regards to the long-term warming signal, one area where we've been really lucky in is to have this downscaled climate projection data for uh, the California current system. This is regional ocean modeling data. And so we have project projections available at um, 10 kilometers, you know, and the global projections are often at one degree. So we're able to resolve some fine scale processes that uh, we just can't do using the global models. And that's really helped our projection work. They've They've done some work to add um, biogeochemistry into that as well with uh, oxygen and chlorophyll and such. So yeah, that's what we're using for most of our, our projection work. Um, we tend to you know, run a hind cast of projections and um, over the previous 30 years or 40 years and compare how well we can do in the hind cast sense to our reserve data because there's no way of validating what we predict to happen at 2100 with what will actually happen at 2100. So that's sort of how we do checks on those long-term warming driven models. Thank you. Yeah. Heather, maybe I can follow up. Um, maybe it's the obvious question since this is the Salish Sea Science Roundtable. What are the opportunities slash challenges of taking the approaches that you, you've used offshore and bringing them into places like the Salish Sea, San Francisco Bay, other, other coastal systems? I think it starts with the resolution of the environmental data. Um, these models predict at um, quarter degree resolution around 25 kilometers. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at those predictions in relation to the Salish Sea and it's just too broad. Um, yeah. It's really coarse. <clears throat> I'm not familiar with what sort of environmental data you guys would use, but I assume you'd be working more on the, you know, five kilometer, sub five kilometer scale. Um, so, so that's the big one that I see is, is the, the sort of blockiness near the coast, not really matching up. And that a lot of our data on um, our animal presence data is from offshore. And so, you know, animals might be queuing in on really different environmental processes in near shore waters. So it'd be it'd be ideal if you're focused on a near shore um, study area to have data that's more finely resolved in that near shore area. We've actually been working with leatherbacks on um, rebuilding these models with with new tagging data that has been filtered. A lot of the times when you tag a leatherback, it'll have this sort of flight pattern where where it'll immediately take off and leave the California current just to get away from the tagging experience. And so we've gone back and, and rebuilt and recalibrated these models without any of this flight data. So we just focused on you know, foraging behavior in the California current. And it's amazing how different those models, those models are, you know, when you've you've really gotten rid of that flight behavior. So some tuning of of account of getting rid of behaviors that we're not really interested in capturing in our models would also be key too, I think. All right, thank you. <clears throat> We've got a question from Cindy, which is, has anyone thought about modeling how the movement of these animals into other areas puts them in competition with other species and what that looks like? Mm. Is that possible? I mean, yeah, it is it is possible. Sure. You could you could look at how um overlap changes as as predators move into the same area. I'd say there's more work being done on how predator prey overlap changes either due to you know episodic environmental events or the long-term climate change whether whether predators will have more prey accessibility or less but yeah there's no reason you couldn't be also looking at competition as well 
I think, I think one of the issues we run into anytime we do an overlap study is just that coincidence in space and time doesn't account for the, the vertical dimension. You know, they might be in different locations in the water column. And then it also is sort of a coarse measure of interaction. Just because they're in the same place in the same time doesn't mean they're actually impacting each other. So I think overlap's a tricky, a tricky one to get at it. A lot of our metrics, you know, are are just overlapping rasters of two different things we're interested in. And there is a lot of research down there on how to how to sort of fine-tune that a bit, which I think is important to, you know, account for when you're doing some overlap work. So I'm going to open the floor up one more time. Any more any more questions for Heather? I'll throw one last one in, Heather, which is just on the management side of this. Like what because you all are really thinking about this in a very applied sense about how does this impact the management decisions? What are some of the new ideas around? Uh, climate ready fisheries that you get excited about and are good context for all of us doing science. Mm. Um, I'm I'm really excited about you know taking tools and lessons learned from kind of more traditional static management like MPA design or you know conservation planning and then applying them into these more dynamic climate ready climate ready management scenarios. So. Some of the spatial prioritization software out there, like maybe you've heard of Markson or Prioritizer. Um, Markson was used to design the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and sort of thinking about how we configure those to do spatial prioritization in a dynamic sense. So that keeps track, keeps pace with shifting species in new climactic um, scenarios, I think is really interesting. Just as a whole, we've been doing, you know, the field of national park design or, or MPA design so much longer than these sort of more flexible climate ready tools. So it's, it's fun to think about, you know, how we take those lessons learned and apply them in this very different context. Right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your research. Certainly lots of thought provoking ideas there. Um, I appreciate everybody joining as well for the, the conversation and the thoughtful questions. Um, as I mentioned, we will post slides, the recording online, um, and then we hope you will join us next month.